we are doubly thrilled, doubly thrilled, as Jeremy pointed out, to have Sarah Smarsh here. Given that Sarah was scheduled, as he said, to speak here in mid-November, um, weather problems, uh, misconnection, Sarah spent nine hours in the Dallas airport. I'm just thrilled that her travels today were uneventful. I was getting a little nervous with the wind that we were having here. I, some people said that as well. So we're just thrilled that, that she's finally here, and uh, we welcome her tonight to Columbus to share her powerful book, Heartland, a memoir of working hard and being broke in the richest country on earth. It was named National Book Award finalist for nonfiction. Sarah's book gives us a unique and essential look into the lives of poor and working class Americans living in the heartland. She combines her personal turbulent history growing up in rural Kansas in the 1980s and 90s with compelling analysis and cultural commentary. The result is an uncompromising look at class, identity, and the particular perils of having less in a country known for its excess. This memoir is beautifully written. Barbara Ehrenreich, author of Nickel and Dime, said this, and I'm going to quote her. You might think that a book about growing up in a poor Kansas farm would qualify as sociology, and Heartland certainly does, but this is so much more than even the best sociology. It is poetry of the wind and snow, the two-lane roads running through the wheat, the summer nights when work-drained families drink and dance under the prairie sky, unquote. Sarah lived a nomadic life until becoming a first-generation college student. Along with her widely published work on socioeconomic class, politics, and public policy in some of the most prestigious publications in the country, she is a Joan Shorenstein Fellow at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. Tonight, Sarah will be in conversation with Michael Wilkos, Senior Vice President of Community Impact at United Way of Central Ohio. Michael's expertise is in community revitalization, and his United Way team develops effective strategies to improve our community, then invests in programs that carry out these strategies. Just a few facts about the struggling families United Way works with. Nearly a third of Franklin County residents live at 200% of or below the federal poverty line. Nearly half of all Franklin County children are being raised in households that struggle daily with financial issues. And like those in Kansas, as Sarah points out so clearly in her book, the working poor often have a hard time getting full-time employment. When and if they do, holding on to it is a constant challenge. After their conversation, Sarah will answer some audience questions and then will sign books in the lobby. So now, please give a warm welcome to Sarah Smarsh and Michael Wilkos. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. I was chatting with Sarah a few moments ago about her, the success of her book, which has taken her to many exotic locations, including her first trip to Columbus. Uh, she will also soon be visiting Australia. Uh, so uh, since Heartland was released a few months ago, it has had tremendous success. Um, how do you feel about that success? And uh, what about members of your family that you write about or even your home community? How have they reacted to the book? Uh, well, that's a great question to start off with because I, I've been a journalist for about 20 years, but um, but this book was really a passion project of mine that, that lest you think it was contrived for this particular political moment when uh, when my part of the country and, and what you might call my class uh, are suddenly in a lot of political headlines, uh, I got my first research grant to begin this book in uh, 2002 when I was a senior in college. Uh, the, why did it take me so long to write it? In part because I was living in poverty most of those years and it takes a lot of time just to uh, get the bills paid. I give you that context to answer this question because what does it feel like for, for the book to be well received, for people like you to, to come out tonight um, with your precious time, uh, to hear from so many readers that somehow I've articulated an aspect of their own life experience that they've not previously seen in a book. It's 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 the honor of my life and it's it's a deeply satisfying dream come true uh and and humbling i've and i've been uh you know um 
when you get attention in any field, then there's this sort of sense among the public that it, you know, you're new to them, and so seemingly an overnight success. Um, and and I've been working as a as a journalist or a writer in some capacity since I was the uh, editor of my high school newspaper in 1996. So um, so for me, it feels like a, a long road that that very much paid off for me, and, and I'm grateful for it. Uh, and my family, um, you know, I know there. Are, I'm sure there are a lot of readers in this room, uh, and um, and and so if you're a, a memoir reader, you might be familiar with a, a a tale of the memoirist who is suddenly estranged from his or her family because they don't like the stories she put down or whatever. Um, while my book is called a memoir, it's actually more of an intergenerational tale in which I'm not so much telling the story of my coming of age as I am rendering a portrait of a family with whom I spent years and years of long interviews, sometimes with beer and whiskey involved, getting stories to document in an effort to capture their subjective truth alongside my own. And perhaps for that reason, um, my, my family has been wholly uh, supportive and thrilled um, by the books, uh, by, by the book being published and, and being well, well received. For many people who live on the coast, Ohio and Kansas are really the same place, but Sarah has a unique view of Kansas and how place really shapes experience. Tell us about the Kansas you know and how it is unique in helping us understand poverty in America today. Mm, I love this question because I feel like um, when we talk about American identity, we're, we are in the last few years grappling with that complicated subject in a way that I, I don't think we, you know, I, I, it does feel like a, a moment in our national conversation where we're, we're starting to get real in ways that we ought to have done long ago. Um, and yet, I, I do feel like place is a left, is, in that piece of the equation is often left out. As a member of the media, I have some theories as to why that might be, um, that really the, the powerful media centers of our country are in, um, are largely uh, well, wholly urban coastal environments, and and those tend to be places with very transient professional populations. So the people who are setting the narrative about our country, um, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but just by default, they are probably people who have used somehow perhaps a different value set in deciding their life trajectories and kind of where to park themselves on the continent. And and so perhaps it is lost on them the extent to which you all take, I would guess, a deep pride in being uh, re residents of this state and this city, uh, as I do about Kansas. Not to say people aren't proud to be New Yorkers and proud to live in LA and so on, but it is a particular relationship to place when when the place that you live, as Michael said, is, is um, uh, either sometimes willfully ignored or misunderstood or characterized with some subtle derision as um, flyover country, Ohio, Kansas, Nebraska. I remember once during my first internship in journalism was in New York City. I was only like two years off the farm. And, um, and a, a woman said to me, where are you from again? Oh, one of those square ones in the middle. <laughs> and um, and, I, and my uh, sense of the psychology that's at work in, in you know, being shaped by an, an awareness of those attitudes is that you, you develop a sort of defiant pride. I don't want to speak for all of you, but that's kind of what happened to me. And, and so, so my Kansas is a place I would start with by saying that it is a, it is a diverse, complicated, nuanced place as opposed to the one-dimensional stereotype of my home that one would glean from uh, overwhelmingly political headlines written by uh, an editor in a newsroom in Manhattan who's never stepped foot there. Um, and, uh, and you know, it's a place, I, I'm sure that it has many things in, in common with Ohio, and, you know, first in terms of just humanity, but also uh, a, a, a perhaps Midwestern sensibility. But, um, you know, as far as Kansas a, as a unique vantage on poverty, it's 
it's interesting to me, and I'm biased, but that it does happen to be the geographical center of the country, and it also happens to be a place that's been very pivotal in in moments in w w where the country is sort of deciding its next I its next identity and where it's going to swing on the political continuum. So, some of you, some of the historians in the room might know uh, a term, "bloody Kansas." That's a reference to the 1850s when there were border wars across the Kansas-Missouri border to um, basically uh, decide whether the, the land that I grew up on would be established as a free state or a slave state like our slaveholding uh, neighbor to the east Missouri. And, um, and it was established as a free state and those battles sort of sparked the Civil War. Um, so I grew up with a deep sense of place, not just the land, you know, that I was tending um, as, as a fifth generation farm kid, but also as just an awareness of, of history where if you live in a place where not a lot of flashy things happen, um, you, I, I feel like um, it's easier to have a sense of deep history. So things are, uh, there are a lot of landmarks that are called like free state brewery, free state Printing press, et, et cetera, and um, uh, and and so f as for how the, all of that relates to poverty, I guess I would just say I hear this a lot. Why don't they just move? If most of the counties in Kansas or Ohio or God forbid Appalachia are dwindling in population and economically dying, why don't they just move? And I'm thinking to myself, like this. You know, my, my history runs so deep there, and it's a complicated one as, as a white person, um, and, but it's also a, 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 a beautiful relationship to that land and to generations of my family and to a history in a state that I wanna do right by. Um, and so if, so, so if that means that, that poverty has the extra onus of staying put in a place that might be keeping you poor, it's a particular vantage on socioeconomics. Sarah, you spent 15 years writing and researching the book. Um, when did you first have the idea to write the book to your imaginary daughter? And talk about that journey of discovery and finding that voice. Mm, okay, so... Um, I'm just curious, how, ha, has anybody in the room read the book already, per, per chance? Oh, wow, cool. <laughs> um, thanks. Uh, so, so Michael's referencing a, uh, the, a kind of direct address that, that structures the book, which is me um, speaking to a would-be child that, that, I, that I didn't have and I very intentionally knew I didn't intend to conceive or bring into the world. And that's because um, I mentioned I'm a fifth generation farm kid. So my, my connection to rural America is very deep. That's on my dad's side of the family. My mom's side of the family was a different version of poverty. They're sort of, um, they're mostly um, from Wichita, which is the biggest city in Kansas. When I was a kid, there were maybe 300,000 people there. It's larger now, of course. And um, so, so my, my women, my, my mother's family grew up in, in Wichita, they, they were, you know, a couple generations off the farm. Anywhere in this country, you know, we're, and probably most people in this room, you're not too many generations removed from that l l lifestyle, uh, especially when we get out here into the center of the country as opposed to um, more uh, uh, um, dense metropolis. But um, on, on my mother's side of the family, the generational legacy is, n is not uh, farming, but rather, um, to put it bluntly, teen pregnancy. So I'm the first female in my direct maternal line to not have a baby as a teenager, back to as far, far back as records were kept into the 19th century. So, um, and I, I was very aware, um, you know, I, I didn't know that research bit about my, my family when I was a kid, but I sensed that there was something about being female within the context of poverty that had everything to do with the biological uh, potential to uh, bear a child and that somehow there was this sort of uh, chicken and the egg thing where being a mom makes being poor harder and being poor makes being a, a mother harder. and. So when I was a kid, I had what now I think there's in the vernacular this um, phrase, life hack. 
Um, when I was a kid, I, I somehow developed this life hack where if I had a difficult decision to make and having come from a family who were, you know, they were holding multiple jobs to make ends meet, um, sometimes self-medicating with booze and cigarettes. This is not a place where anybody's pausing to say, how do you feel about this, Sarah? You know, um, and you know, a lot of love in my family, but such were the circumstances. And so when I had to navigate a difficult decision as a kid, and I wasn't really receiving, um, you know, adult wisdom, and I'm not sure they would have claimed they knew the answer anyway, uh, I would ask myself, don't ask me why, I'm talking about at like age 12, I would say, if I if I had a daughter, what would I want for her? What would I do for her? And I understand now psychologically that when, when if you're a, a, a poor farm girl, the, the, the world's message, the, the messages you are receiving about your place and your people such that they even exist in popular culture and the news media tend to be whole, uh, overwhelmingly negative. Stereotypes, caricatures, uh, of, let's say, ignorant fools. Um, that doesn't represent my family at all. Um, and it was a, it was a painful, um, it was a painful way to develop a self-regard. And so whatever shame and doubt about myself resulted from that, I think what I was doing was overriding that by then imagining some child that didn't exist and then finding a deep love for that potential being that I perhaps di didn't yet know to have for myself. So whatever the answer to that question was, what would I want for my daughter, then I would do that for me. Even if, it, even if I didn't consciously feel like I deserved whatever that good thing was. So um, that was a very l real lived experience for me for much of my upbringing. Michael's wondering when that came into the book, and actually it was, that was sort of like at the last hour in terms of the creative process. I had been with the book for 15 years, and uh, kind of my journalist self was um, putting forth social analysis and cultural critiques and some research, and, and I was wearing that hat and some of the passages in the book, and then, and then really at its root, I was you know bearing my soul and talking about my family in a very intimate way. Uh, in a more memoiristic form. And somehow those two aspects of the narrative were not quite gelling together. And then it occurred to me, and I have no, I was on a walk, and um, you know, my editor was like, we need to get, get this thing going. And um, you know, I, so I had signed the book deal, which was thrilling, but then like you go through a bunch of rewrites and there are all these edits, and, and it wasn't quite there yet. And, um, and I thought, wow, you know, that, very deep subconscious conversation dialogue with some kid that didn't exist and um, is is a way to both let the reader in in a way that maybe I haven't yet and also a way to bridge those more journalistic um, sections of the book with my very intimate narrative in that the a the relationship that that we have to our bodies or our but, you know, what could be more intimate than whether you're going to have children or, or your, your own, you know, physical person, how that relates to public forces that uh, make one predisposed to poverty. Um, and so I thought, you know, therein lies um, that sort of double helix. And, and if I reveal that to the reader, then maybe all of those pieces will flow together. And, and I hope they did. I don't normally have such intellectual epiphanies on walks around my neighborhood, but thank you for that. Um, but you courageously take on this issue of racial privilege while being economically disadvantaged. And early in the book, you write, uh, quote, we can't really know what made us who we are. We can come to understand, though, what the world says we are. You weave the conflict between racial privilege and being economically disadvantaged, and that your situation represents something that many Americans simply don't understand. And that is, again, quote, if a person can go to work every day and not pay their bills, and the reason isn't racism, what less articulated problem is afoot? Talk more about what problem is afoot. Well, I think that problem um, is the class structure within our country that uh, just up until a couple of years ago we were largely pretending didn't exist. Um, 
it, by the way, has everything to do with um, white supremacist foundations of our nation, as well as um, you know intersections with gender and a myriad of other aspects of American identity. But I think it deserves to be to be articulated in its own right, along with those other aspects of American life and self. So, um, so you know, I have to say, it's been. Uh, as someone who writes about class, it's been, uh, I have found it very distasteful to see members of my own news media um, uh, talk about the working class since uh, the 2016 presidential election largely as something that from looking at headlines or watching the news, you'd think that the working class is all, first of all, white folks, second of all, conservative folks, third of all, preferably men who have some connection to coal mining or they wear tool belts. And, um, and by the way, my dad is a lifelong construction worker, white man, uh, not a conservative, uh, uh, but um, it's, I uh, bristle at uh, and the portrayal of the, the, the class that I belong to as, as a monolith in any of those ways, which it certainly isn't. Um, and that's a that's a um, that that's an insult both to people who who defy any of those stereotypes, um, and and it's also an insult in some ways to, um, to to my own family, who is indeed white working class, and yet the the portrayals that I see of that concept in the in modern American lore are um, are uh, simplistic and often very dangerous and leveraged to great effect um, sometimes by political factions with, with ill intent. So, um, so, so I have felt like what it's my job in the class conversation if I'm talking about um, my story and where I come from, which is the only thing I can speak for or speak to. By the way, you will never see me claim that I speak for even the entire white working class. Some writers happy to step up and claim to do that. Um, but uh, for, for me, I can tell you what I've seen with my own eyes, what, the shoes I have walked in, and that involves whiteness. Um, and, and it involves um, simultaneously carrying thus racial privilege and economic disadvantage. Those two things can exist simultaneously. Um, and you know, I am not, I'm not an economist, I'm not a sociologist, uh, but I am somebody who has been reporting on uh, people in the most unseen corners of our, our society for many years, and I am someone who, who, who has, you know, walked in the shoes of, of a, a little girl and, an, and a teenager and a young woman in poverty. And, uh, and, and so, um, there, there is at that crux of the um, simultaneous uh, privilege and disadvantage uh, a, a myriad of ideas that the country has got to begin to grapple with. And one of those ideas is, is racism. Um, and I'll expand on that by saying, you know, I can say like, um, I'm a fifth generation Kansas farm kid. I was poor when we grew up. I never would have used that word about myself when I was a kid, by the way. We had food and a roof over our head and shoes on our feet when we needed them. Uh, and, and so by, by my estimate and my family's estimate, um, we, we weren't poor. Of course, I learned as I grew older that we, that we certainly were by just about every measure, including federal income guidelines. Um, but, but I say that because, and, and yet, we, we owned a little patch of land in Kansas. Well, how do we come by that land? We, because of the color of our skin and, and the, our um, ethnic origin being, in, being European, I'm descended largely from, from poor European immigrants who were handed that land that was stolen from indigenous tribes. So, so while that's not the same thing as being the, 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 the white power that made that federal policy, it is nonetheless um, a benefit that reverberates economically across generations. So uh, this is, um, you know, and I, I point these things out in my book, and at the same time, when in matters of the intersection of race and, and class, um, I find it, or at least my, my truth, what feels right to me is, is to defer um, to people who are on the, um, uh, the less privileged end of the race continuum in, in 
teaching me about what, what that means in America. What I can speak to is being both white and poor, and therein lies some kind of important conversation. Sir, your family moved 21 times before you finished high school. You write about the worthwhile gamble for the poor to drift, that often there is little to lose by moving and hoping for something better. Talk with us about both the stress you endured by moving so much, but this sense of optimism that it also gave you. Mm. Yeah, you know, poverty has a, to go back to our conversation about place, it, it really um, can, can be hell on your, your connection to community. Uh, in part because you're so ragged by the end of the day, you don't have the energy to go out and do anything that would connect you with that community. In part because you wouldn't have money for the ticket anyway. Uh, in part because the, the, the culture often of at least the version of poverty that I knew is very insular and, and I have a feeling that that, so we very much kind of like kept to ourselves as a family. You know, um, friendships were, were either developed at, at work is like our work and life simultaneously are like that's synonymous where I come from um, and and so you know there'd be my grandma's friends from the courthouse in Wichita where she drove every day to there from the farm to work as a probation officer there'd be friends from the courthouse who'd be partying with us on at the farmhouse um, but for the most part we sort of we were kind of de detached from, from place in this sense, in the sense of what's happening here this evening, civic conversation and engagement, cultural in, uh, involvement and appreciation. Those were just not aspects of my, my um, uh, upbringing. And, and for that reason, you can feel, feel kind of untethered, I guess what I'm saying. And, and often that is by necessity because uh, if, there, if there's an eviction because the rent couldn't be paid, or say a foreclosure if, if a house was owned, um, or uh, to go back to some previous generations before me, I, I, I happened to grow up with a very kind and gentle father, fortunately, but I was kind of an anomaly in my family in that way, and women before me often were transient because they were fleeing an abusive man at a moment when they had little legal or court, cultural social resource to, um, recourse to, um, you know, turn turn to the law or, or neighbors for protection. So there are all kinds of reasons that can make you need need to pick up and move when you're poor that just don't happen when you're middle class or, or better off. Um, and so um, that might, you know, conflict with the picture I've painted of being a, a farm kid. Uh, it's a little bit complicated, and I talk about it in the book, but it's really, um, you know, I was out in the country, then my mom and dad divorced, and it was in the late 80s. My childhood was very much like the, that, that peak moment of what they called the farm crisis. Of course, there's another one of those happening right now, and it never really ended, and in some ways it's been going on since the Industrial Revolution, or at least since corporate big ag moved into those spaces in the middle of the 20th century. Um, but it really came to a head during my childhood, and so, um, so that meant that when my parents got a divorce, uh, and my mom moved to Wichita because that's where she's from and that's where she wanted to be. She's never ha wanted anything to do with <coughs> flannel shirts and cowboy boots. Um, but uh, that meant that my, my dad had to move too because there's no, he couldn't alone hang out there uh, economically at that point by 1989. There was a recession on. He also made a living as a construction worker and there'd been a, a slowdown in that industry. So we moved to Wichita, and thus began a whole bunch of moving around. Uh, like Michael said, I moved 21 times by the time I was in high school. I did end up out on my grandparents' farm. That's where I spent most of my adolescence, actually, back in the country. Um, but I went to, nonetheless, eight schools by the time I was in ninth grade. And um, that, uh, I think, actually kind of helped shape me into a writer in some ways, because it was a, it's a real lesson um, in, in what we might term in my realm as an author, um, uh, character development, in that um, I, I found and I noticed that every school I went to, there was sort of like the same cast of characters. It was just like different people, you know, there's like the short, cute, popular girl, the um, kind of regal, tall girl, the sporty, 
this and that guy. Like there's, there were these sort of like, I, I realized kind of archetypes that are, you know, we could look at them as, as stereotypes or one dimensional portraits, but there was also some kind of truth in them. And, and I also found a real humility in that process, which was that, um, you know, I, I, I came, came and went and people's lives went on with or without me. And so there was a real loneliness in that. Um, but lo uh, being able to uh, to withstand lone loneliness come, comes in handy for someone who's going to spend 15 years writing a book. <laughs> um, so uh, so I think it just it really shaped. It was a bummer in a lot of ways, but it um, it gave me a lot of the tools that I needed for what I do. You write a lot about how um, poverty is particularly stressful on mothers, and I was. Uh, quite uh, moved by this one quote when you said, I think sometimes my mom didn't really hate having children as a young woman. She hated her life and the children who came into it would feel that. Heartland is not a political book, but the connection between public forces and private experiences are linked. If you could change a policy to provide more support to vulnerable families, what would that look like? And what could communities or even employers do to support vulnerable families? Oh my gosh, I love this question. So, so my mom was um, just to get for those of you who haven't read, just to provide a little context for this, um, you know, kind of emotional distress that's of hers that, that's documented in that uh, sentence. Um, my mom was a, a brilliant brilliant woman. Um, she was born into a, a more severe v version of poverty than I was in 1962 to a 16-year-old um, Wichita girl, and then she herself was 17 when she became pregnant with me. And um, and so I, I, I just kind of had this palpable sense, not that she ever said, said as much in words to me, but I could feel that the fact that I had come along um, had something to do with uh, the economic outcomes in her life that that looked very much like um, how do I put this a, a suppression of her own innate gifts and the things that she ought to have been able to give to society and to receive from it um, there for, for her there was not room for both motherhood and those aspirations because society wasn't and I would argue perhaps is not still uh, constructed um, to allow f allow for it. So um, so if, so if I could, you know, policy that if if I you know center this on my my brilliant mom and and the the, the gifts she didn't get to share with the world, I would say um, you know, I've just, I've seen talk recently of of universal child care. Um, I think that would both be great for kids, um, you know, kind of have a kind of equalizing or democratizing effect on the children of this country in that, as we know, I think regardless of our politics, we have to agree that not all kids get the same, are, are dealt the same hand. You know what I mean? What we think ought to be done about that is a, you know, a conversation where a lot of disagreement surely enters, but um, hopefully we could agree that, you know, some kids are born with more opportunities than others. And, and when you put it all on the family, uh, you're, you're shortchanging children for whom uh, the, the family doesn't have the resources or the know-how or the education or the time or the money to give and do the things they would with the deep love they have if they could. Um, and so if, if there were some sort of uh, universal or, you know, like a, a policy investment in all of our children from, from child care so that mom and dad both can go to work um, or or, or in early childhood education so that there is a, a leveling of the playing field at those crucial ages in a child's development when some have parents who, who have time to read to them and some don't. Uh, I think that would be transformational both for the future generations of our country that those children currently comprise, but also for, for the, the mothers and fathers um, uh, in particular who are, are struggling to uh, be able to afford just school supplies for the kids. You also wrote about um, having to make the decision between kind of quitting a job, right, or caring for a family. So let's talk about some employers and what they could be doing to maybe support families so people could 
get a job and keep that job. Mm. Well, this is might sound silly and maybe it's a lofty idea, but let's if if we could just for a moment say that we're there's like um fewer limitations than perhaps exist in the real world. My my first vote would just be for pay people more. <laughs> Uh, pay women more in particular and, and people of color, but, but everybody. My, my white carpenter dad has been woefully underpaid for breaking his body for the last five decades. Um, and uh, I just, you know, often conversations about poverty, I think it's so complicated, you know, if we move this piece around here and da da da, and then this goes down to the, the folks at the bottom and blah blah blah. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I can tell you how to solve poverty. Give people money. <laughs> people need money. I mean, whether you wh where you find that on you know on the political spectrum, whether it come via private or public forces, honestly matters less to me than than that somehow um, the 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 working people of this country are more fairly compensated for their labor and time, which. Anybody who's been following the news for the last few years, uh, regardless of political stripes, um, surely knows that we're at a moment of historic wealth inequality, and that's a, a very dangerous um, and toxic way for a society to c carry itself, and it's uh, particularly ironic and um, uh, regrettable, I would say, in a country as wealthy as ours. Um, so, so my magic uh, wand about employers, and I'm sure that there are a lot of employers who, who would like to pay more than they can, and yet I, I am certain that there are, are plenty um, who are, are billionaires in their own right who, who certainly could afford um, to, to pay their workers more, and they, they choose not You had a lot of stress and trauma in your childhood, and you wrote, quote, your childhood amounted to being awake in a grown-up's nightmare. Yours was about poverty and its psychological and mortal dangers. But there was also a lot of love in your family. What role did love from family members have in defining who you think you are today? Mm. I like this question because I find that people who don't come from where I do can, if they even in earnest or with the best of intentions, try to tell the stories of that place and people, it often comes across as what you may have heard this term before, poverty porn. It's sort of like a, I don't know if it's the guilt somewhere latent in the storyteller or the, you know, the well-intended reporter from a affluent New York experience coming into Ohio to get the story at the diner on Main Street. Um, and, and I find there's this, sometimes a condescension, but more often just kind of a, a, a pitying that I don't care for. It doesn't strike me right because, um, first of all, I, I don't feel sorry for myself about where I come from. In fact, in many cases, I, I wouldn't trade places with that more privileged person trying to tell the story because... Uh, like Michael said, there, were, there was a lot of love uh, in my family and a lot of laughter. There's a lot of freedom that actually can come from being just flat broke in a country that is so obsessed with money. Um, certainly not to glamorize it. And it is preferable to be able to pay your bills because uh, I've been in both camps. But, um, you know, when you've got nothing to lose, that a, that's a, can be a kind of badass way to live. The women I was raised by, in large part, were absolutely formidable. Take no crap, salty Midwestern dames. And, and that was in part because they had no, they weren't on the PTA, they, they had no social standing and nothing. All they had was their job where they made minimum wage and their family where they, you know, held various roles. And, um, and, uh, that freedom sort of, well, what it looked like in my childhood, which was quite feral, whether it was on the farm or roving the streets of Wichita as a pre-adolescent, pre um, was like, and I'm not saying that this is a good thing, but, but often my, my family was so busy that I just had an immense amount of maybe too much freedom. And, uh, and I was a pretty responsible kid, so that it didn't end up being to my detriment. But it was, um, I... I, I did not write, this is why I didn't write. A lot of memoirs you'll find about poverty are sort of like a litany 
of the most salacious and awful tales that can be dredged up from the 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 childhood and if and if I had written that this would be a very different book there's all kinds of things that would make people gasp that I didn't write because that wasn't what I was out to do uh, I was out to document the complexity of my family and that experience and if I'm going to do right by that then I better talk about the beautiful parts too and the at the center of that beauty was my my family's love so um, I grew up often in uh, intergenerational households, which is often a f more of a feature of um, poor households and, and perhaps um, uh, there may be some immigrant populations or um, minority ethnic cultures in this country where this is still a common feature of the family household. But as far as like the white middle class suburban nuclear American unit like the um, it's, it uh, was strange to some of my friends when I was growing up as a kid that I lived in the same house as my, you know, like a parent, a grandparent, and a great grandparent. That was by economic necessity, but what it bred was a deep commitment to each other um, that I think probably has a lot to do with why I live in today by choice, proudly, a place that my profession and society has told me I ought to get out of. So you leave small town, uh, rural America, you get to college, and it begins to dismantle your political views of fiscal policy. You said that you had been sold a bill of goods. Uh, talk with us about how you struggled with seeing the world through this new lens. Mm, okay, so this is gonna get a, l a little bit political just in that I'm gonna share a little bit of that, my development journey in that column of life. So um, being raised in like, uh, you know, as a childhood in the Reagan era and then a, a teenager in the 90s. And so being, having been born in 1980, my, my life, you can really track um, the, the years of my life with some major political shifts in the country. So, so in 1980, when I was an infant, my mother who was living in poverty in rural Kansas. She was, she had just turned 18. I was, you know, an infant and the election came along in November of 1980 and she cast her ballot for Jimmy Carter, which was very much in keeping with the, um, the uh, political sentiment of where we came from in, if you, if you take a, a long lens on history, um, Kansas, and, and I, I don't know about, about this depth of history in Ohio, but for in Kansas, um, we had a, a strong sense of what used to be called prairie populism. So it was a very uh, progressive politics. Kansas and many states in the West really led the charge for women's suffrage and, and also seeking black suffrage. Uh, long before um, you know places that we now consider blue states had had passed such legislation and um, and there are myriad reasons for that that I don't have to go into but um, but it, but anyway I think it's easy to to forget now that you know CNN we're already moving into the 2020 political obsessions with the presidential campaign and they throw up that map and you got your red states and your blue states America has a dangerously short-term memory uh, about politics and about culture and, um, and so it might surprise um, uh, MSNBC host if I told him or her that my mom voted for Jimmy Carter that year. Uh, I don't know that it necessarily surprises anybody in this room. Now, by 1984, that was the same year that my bro little brother was born, we're still living out in the country, and my mom voted for Reagan that year. And that was actually a pretty common trend is that there, there was a sort of a shift toward um, Reagan's version of conservatism that um, very different from from what the GOP looks like today and nonetheless uh, it, it was um, it, it did represent a, a party realignment that that in in many ways was was drawn along race lines now I think that for somebody like my mom what happened was Reagan appears to be beloved. People, he, there's like the cultural sentiment that he's like the winner and he's a good president. Um, you know, sh she wasn't into, let's say like at the time um, there was some, when I was a toddler, um, that his party was, was 
working against the Equal Rights Amendment. My mom absolutely would have been for the passing of the Equal Rights Amendment, which, which ended up failing in the context of that political moment. But, but yet she voted, she voted for Reagan by 1984, so something had moved. <clears throat> then by the, by the 90s, when I'm a teenager, there's really a, a robust um, uh, conservative swelling um, that includes both uh, media outlets like the, the um, the onset of Fox News, uh, conservative talk radio, and its sort of initial prime with Rush Limbaugh and such, and um, and there there were a couple of years when I was a teenager when um, there were some aspects of those ideas, not not on social issues, um, uh, but but I definitely I I would have as a teenager described myself as um, socially liberal and economically conservative. I don't, you know, like, that would be a long debate about, like, whether that is even, like, a, a, a viable mixture and what someone is claiming in, in saying that. Uh, but, but as a, you know, someone with a novice in the realm of figuring out politics, that's kind of what I thought, that's what had been shaped by my place. Then I went to the University of Kansas campus, um, and for a few years I was sort of like the odd woman out on my student newspaper um, uh, staff for having what I would call like moderately conservative views. And then uh, I took a class called the Sociology of Families. And that, that class was all about, it was my, like my junior, senior year, and it was about, um, it was about probabilities and how where you come, the, the extent to which where you come from shapes where you are probable to end up. And this was just like numbers. It wasn't anybody proselytizing me you know, in one direction or another politically, and I was, and, and it, um, for me, uh, what I did with that was it, it, I processed it, and I thought, you know, this idea that I have been carrying with me that's, that's very, that's very precious to, to the um, conservative politics of this country, that you get what you earn, and hard work pays off, and, um, and it, and this sort of, like, defiant individualism that, uh, it, th that extreme, it, uh, it struck me, um, was not the whole truth. Of course, yeah, of course there's some personal responsibility to bear in making one's way through the world. Uh, but I was looking around and thinking, like, everybody I know has been working their ass off since they were 14 years old. And, and actually, um, maybe, maybe these, like, more liberal policies that are attempting to uh, level a playing field um, makes sense to me now. So uh, m I didn't come here tonight to give you a spiel about my own politics, but I think that what's what's valuable about that to this conversation and to what I do as a writer is um, is the lack of humility, I think, that, that so many people have, particularly pundits in my own industry, when they are talking about politics, and whether it's on the um, more well-off factions of the left, shaking their finger at um, someone's vote in small town middle America, uh, or whether it is um, on, the, on the right and a sort of haughty sense of, um, uh, defiance toward some idea of a federal politics. It, in in both directions, I find there there is a, a a dangerous level of of tribalism that the 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 root of which is the presumption that someone's politics and voting behavior necessarily represents their core and who they are. Now, this is a slight a separate discussion. Is like no wittingly supporting policies that, that are hateful or clearly intended to harm a group of people or privilege another group, that's a different thing. I'm not talking about let's have empathy in that direction. But what I am talking about is if you're a 16-year-old girl in um, small town uh, Oklahoma and, um, and every political message you have received your entire life um, is tending toward the conservative. Her conservative vote in in a, her first presidential election is no different in terms of how it was shaped than a girl who grew up in a liberal environment 
casting about a vote for a Democrat in her first election. Um, we are entirely the products of our environments in so many ways, and that includes politics. So income and, and all sorts of things actually don't, uh, when you look at sociology, predict someone's political behavior. What does predict her political behavior is her social group, her environment, her, her influences of her peers. And that includes family to some extent, but um, but it's no it's uh, it's not necessarily shocking that my views changed once I got different information. So we'll do one last question, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, and along that line, with little debate, we are really living in a very polarized time in this country. But you really challenge people to examine how society uses and interprets certain terms. I've heard in many interviews. Uh, your uh, dissatisfaction with terms like Trump country or urban rural divide and red states versus blue states. And you, you feel that these terms really oversimplify and they hurt a more healthy dialogue about race and class in America. Tell us a little bit more about that. Mm. Well, we're very much in a media moment, aren't we, where um, clicks rule the you know, it, it's sort of like this cyclical relationship with the, the online click in that um, the, the content that is available to us is, is what one might click on. And then when one clicks on it, it, it perpetuates the creation of like content um, because the uh, media corporations that are, that are seeking your eyeballs and perhaps your money and certainly advertising dollars um, knowing that your eyeballs will be there, are are the, their interests are not the same as what my interests were getting into journalism. I went into I became a journalist for for to be a government watchdog, to be a, a proud member of what is sometimes called the fourth estate. So you have the three branches of government that hopefully have checks and balances. But then who's gonna who's gonna watch over all of that kit and caboodle and let you all know what's really going on, you know? And, the, and there are many journalists who are, who are endeavoring to do that work today, um, but um, their best efforts at the nuance and complexity of the political character of this country, whether it be the state of Ohio or the state of Kansas or an entire race or class of people, is utterly um, often compromised and damaged by the m very profitable model of seizing on an, an easy idea, a simplistic concept, a catchphrase, preferably with as deep of conflict as possible. So, so when, when you all turn on CNN or MSNBC or Fox News, I don't care which one, what they all have in common is that they will be pitting something against something else. And that is not by accident. It's because ratings go up when, they're, when, when blood boils. And so the talking heads that you see arguing across a the table, they're, they're not there, if you've noticed, to inform you about policy. I don't know if you ever get done with that show and know more about policy than when you started. But what you know more about is a, just what has deepened is your, your sense of conflict in our country. This isn't to suggest that, the, that there aren't real um, divides and fractures in our society. But, but the irony is that those narratives then perpetuate it and we begin to believe it about ourselves and, and fixate on differences that then in the um, social media silos that, that we create for ourselves on Facebook or Twitter with a, most often a, a, a camp of like-minded folks um, renders a, a society that is becoming fragmented in ways that by my estimation as a journalist, should have gone in the other direction if technology were being used the way that it could to, to, to bring us together. So, um, so, so I encourage everybody in this room to resist using terms like Trump country or red state or blue state or you know the rural urban divide, me, me being somebody that most often works in urban environments and, and hails from and continues to be part of rural America, I'm thinking to myself like, there, it's not like there's some line and there's two different kinds of people and the way that I know is I'm on, I'm on both sides of that line, I'm just one person. And, um, and so these myths uh, are, are very profitable 
for, um, and by the way, I have to add that since we're at, in a moment where um, journalism is being, um, uh, kind of is kind of under attack or being torn down by um, uh, pieces of the political puzzle who, who are perhaps threatened by it, um, you know, I, I don't want to. I don't want to rail against the journalists as an. You know, like this is all the media's fault. That's not what I'm saying. Um, because there are, if what we need more of as a country is what I would call media literacy. So for for the well-intentioned media consumer to be to be able to both know the difference and employ the self-control required to turn off what is toxic and un unhelpful and to find and seek out and pay money for so that they can pay their reporters um, the outlets that are that are, contain nuance and and true stories about your place and all places that, that you won't see um, at the top of the ratings. Let's give a warm welcome to Sarah Schmarsh. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a microphone that's uh, moving around the audience. If someone has a question, we don't. So you're going to stand and speak loudly, and we can repeat the question. Yes, sir. Hi, Sarah. Hi. I have not read your book, but my wife has, and she's been giving me a play by play next You talked a lot about, you've got really clear um, critiques of both the um, environment that you're talking about and like our larger culture. I, as you know, so many of us see, I saw a headline on Facebook the other day. A friend shared an article. I did not read the article, but I've seen the sort of inference that that headline made before is that there's a lot of profit in poor people. What role do you think it, you know, larger forces play in wanting to ensure that there are poor people that can be taken um, advantage of with, you know, buy your car, pay, pay weekly, uh, you know, the cash check advance places, the, uh, you know, Dollar General stores. Can you, can you speak to that? Yeah, that's a great question. This is sometimes referred to, you know, you might have heard, raise your hand if you've heard the term, the, the criminalization of poverty. That's often, um, that's, you know, often getting at the ways in which, in which our, our legal system, um, uh, disproportionately ensnares uh, people who don't have much money, and that has to do with, you know, whether it's a busted tail light on a car or uh, being laid on child support or whatever. Is you don't have money, then you get in trouble, uh, and often then there's fines for that. And now that relates to what what I would call the monetization of poverty. Um, so so every one of those uh, cr criminalizations. To go back to journalism 101, um, as a reporter, follow the money, and and every one of those um, petty crimes somehow links to some crimes uh, somehow links up to somebody else's wealth, whether that is the prison industrial complex where um, overwhelmingly poor folks and certainly disproportionately poor people of color uh, end up behind bars. Um, uh, often for very minor offenses, that imprisonment is someone else's profit uh, within an increasingly privatized system. Um, that, that's a big sort of systemic example, but just to go back to more of, I think, what the questioner is getting at, even just things like, um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's James Baldwin, uh, the great writer and thinker who said, um, uh, um, this might not be the exact quote, but it's like it's it's very expensive to be poor. So if if you got to take out, you know, you you're you got laid off, and so you couldn't make your payment after 2008, and your house was foreclosed on, and so then you had to file bankruptcy, and now every loan that you take out has 20% interest. My dad right now is driving a work pickup that he. Because he that exam, uh, sort of track of experiences I just gave was in fact um, an experience of his. Unfortunately, later in his um, career as a construction worker, and and the work truck that he uses right now to get to job sites all over the Midwest was purchased with a, a like an 18 percent loan that he still pays that interest on. Um, the uh, let's see, I wrote something for the New Yorker a few years ago when 
my state legislature in Kansas, this was under uh, Governor Brownback, whom some of you may have heard of, uh, to his administration lowered um, the the minimum. Okay, so so for people who receive public what used to be called welfare, but now it's public assistance. Um, TANF is is like the fund, the the federal money that then goes through the state government and they distribute it to people in need. Um, well, it used to be you you get you get cut a check for that and then you go cash it and then you go get your groceries and all the things you haven't been able to buy for the last month. Um, but, but now that's all, it all comes through these little carts that, um, which are overseen by big giant banking corporations. And my, uh, and the Kansas legislature reduced the amount that one could take out at one swipe. So it used to be like, I don't know, $200 or maybe unlimited. And no lie, they passed a law that you can only take out $25 at a time. And do you want to know why? Because every time you make that transaction, there's a dollar fee that goes to the bank that the state of Kansas has contracted with for that public program. So, uh, you know, those, those little dings, um, the, 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 the terrible irony of this, of course, is that the people who can afford those little dings the least are the ones who receive them the most. And I have to say that now, you know, um, I mean, I've still got a bunch of student loans and I live in a fixer upper house. I'm certainly not like high on the hog by any means, but, um, but just in, you know, things like um, being nominated for the National Book Awards, I was in a very rarefied space and a beautiful old bank on Wall Street that they uh, have for this formal gala. And, and you go to something like that and, people, and you, you get free stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, like, I'll certainly take it. Um, but like, we're in a society where the, the people who don't need free stuff get it, and the people who can't afford fees pay them. Uh, something entirely perverse about that. There's the question in the back, yes. Yeah, I grew up in poor rural West Virginia where everybody knew was in poverty. And at six years old, I knew I didn't want to be poor. I'm wondering if you had a similar moment where you knew you did not want to live that life. And if you talked to other people, and if they had a similar moment. Mm. Thank you first for sharing a bit of your own story. Um, you know, I don't remember a, a moment sort of like an epiphany, but I, I did, um, for me, I think it maybe had more to do with like my disposition as somebody that probably whether, regardless of where, what I'd been born into, probably would have been an, an artistic or, or writerly person of some kind. It's just kind of my nature. Um, that meant that I was very, sensitive and always observing my surroundings and and I think it's because of that that I just it was more for me sort of like a gradual awakening to like oh um because when you're a kid it's all you know it's it's all you know it's all you know you don't you don't even know and even some the idea of poverty is is relative but I did start to piece together like oh like my friends always have change for a candy bar when we run across the parking lot during middle school recess and I don't, you know, you piece them together like, oh, my proud family, loving family, nonetheless, um, seems to uh, be on the um, shortchanged end of some kind of system in this country. And, um, and yeah, I knew, I knew, and I looked around and thought like, okay, I'll, what these patterns seem to be teen pregnancy, not finishing high school, uh, manual labor. So if I wanna have like different outcomes, I'm gonna make sure there is not a teen pregnancy. I do finish high school. I, so it, I started kind of calculating this very, you know, I was a very ambitious kid and driven. I can't say there was a specific moment, but yes, there was an intentional battle plan. I knew I was trying to do something different than anything that was around me or had come before me. And hats off to you in that regard because it can be a, a lonely mission. I am a city kid. I'll define myself in that food comes from the store and eggs are a dairy product because they're in the dairy case. Right. And that defines you as a city kid because a farm person knows that eggs are not a dairy product. I, my wife uh, has read the book and handed it to me. She teaches across the street. 
I'm interested in whether you have looked at some of the similar stories from different times and places in preparing this. And I get two examples of books, books that I used when I've taught. And the first one, I, know you, I, I do know from flipping through the book before I read it that you talked some about the educational system in the rural areas and its limits and failures. And there's a lot of that that we've talked about here in Ohio. It's a big political issue still. Uh, and so I'm not thinking, it was a 60s book, not so much thinking of The Other America, which is an analytical book, but a book of stories. And the story book is from a teacher in Boston, where, which is my hometown, in the 60s called Death at an Early Age. And his stories about trying to teach and the limits of the students, the limits of their families, the limits of the community, <coughs> the limits of the administration. And the other, of course, was goes back further into the Depression for rural poverty, and it's, it's one of the books that I also looked at, and, uh, and if, uh, not only it's got photographs as well as people's own stories, and that is, of course, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Yes. Did they form you? How do you contrast your work and your writing when you see things like that? Mm. Um, thanks. That's a, a great question. You know, formative texts. Um, and I don't know the first book that you cited, but um, you know this. This might not be the the right answer for a writer, but it's an honest one, and I'm going to tell you. Um, you know, I, I just was. My, my mom was the only other person in in my family who who read pretty much anything. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of newspaper reading going on beyond her, but we were the only two sort of like book people. And, and the books that she had in our house were certainly not books of, you know, um, current events or social issues or history. They tended to be like um, popular fiction, like Stephen King or Margaret Atwood. And so, um, you know, the, I, I was not steeped in, in a, any sort of sense of an ability to assess my environment by way of critique in someone else's book. So it wasn't until I got to college that that even became like a, a mode for my brain. Um, and, and it turned out as a mode I liked and I hopefully harnessed to, to good effect in my book. But as far as like what, what were formative for me in, in thinking about class, um, I, in all honesty, began this book before I found the texts that I would that I now consider sort of my go-to on matters of, of class and economic inequality or rural urban and all that. Um, and so so what I began with, I mean, I knew I was I when I was like eight years old, I told my grandma I'm going to write our, a, a book about our family. Um, this her story, um, uh, and and so I was sort of already on the path to tell the tale in a very personal way and I didn't even, I didn't even, not only did I not understand why it might matter to the national conversation, I didn't even care if it did. I just felt this natural drive to tell my, my family's story in an intimate way and that's what I began to do like as a college student when I got those first research grants to start interviewing my family, piece together a family history from the, the chaos of poverty and record keeping. Um, and then along the way, I started finding books that opened my eyes to, oh, that's why this story matters. And that's why those of you who read the book will find such a, a kind of curious amalgamation within uh, the annals of contemporary literature of, of, of both a, a, a rootedness and personal story, but also a, a reaching out with research and context. So. Um, so yeah, um, I guess it depends on how we talk about a formative text because in fact, I think for me as someone in terms of language, the most form formative use of language for me growing up was very much oral. My family's a bunch of great storytellers. But as far, and, and I started to, um, I started to come into my awareness about class also just by nature of my experience. Being on the KU campus, brush and shoulders with kids who like, had a car handed to them as a high school graduation gift and their parents paid for everything and 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 that's where you know all of all of those awakenings were initially very much organic and lived um, and then it was a more intentional seeking out of of books um, that and and figuring out that I, I would say 
for example, that, that I'm, I'm a big fan of Studs Terkel. If any of you know that writer who was really um, an, an oral historian of, of, a, of a, in a sense, but who documented ultimately those tales in books about his, his seminal book being called Work, um, Working, I'm sorry. Um, uh, you know, when I would find the rare book that allowed people like the people I knew to speak in their own voices, I got very excited. So I also really dug like some of the um, best-selling memoirs of the 90s that tended to be about kind of hard scrabble lives, whether it's um, The Liars Club by Mary Carr, uh, The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls, Angela's Ashes by Frank McCourt, um, even to go back to the 60s, it, though I didn't discover it until I was maybe in my early 20s, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. So um, it was, um, for me, uh, a less academic understanding that informed the book than just a, a deeply personal one. We had a gentleman here in the back. Yes. Um, hi. I read your book. Um, I, on my mom's side, we go back, I recently learned, uh, eight generations in Ohio. Uh, so, wow. But my, my dad, that's not true. Um, and I come from a family of, we were very poor, 14 kids um, with welfare, food stamps, um, that kind of stuff. But with 14 kids, we've all grown up and gone in many different directions. And I'm, I'm wondering why people take a different world view when they come from the same family. I mean, I have very, very, what's the word, red state family, and I have very, very blue state family, but we all grew up poor in Southern Ohio. And uh, how does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy one. Um, well, first, thank you, you know, for, for sharing a bit of your story and bearing witness to that. Um, you know, as far as, but, and I, I, I suppose it is a, a, a question that suits me and my, um, what I've done in my life professionally in that what I'm always trying to do is to get us to look at what I think is the overlooked interplay between public forces and private lives. And, and, and it's a good question. You know, if, if, we're, if we're shaped by our environment and you share a relatively same environment with your many siblings and you, and you all come out different, how do we, how do we uh, account for that? You know, I think that um, this is where, uh, you know, in, in case my hand hasn't been shown yet, I definitely today identify politically as, as a political progressive. Um, but, but within my political camp, if you will, I, I often find that it, that it um, shortchanges something that I do value and respect as true uh, w within his historically conservative thought, which is the the importance and the power of the individual. I think ain't nothing either. Um, and I know that there there is something about nature and nurture being um, uh, two different forces. Um, one is external and, and one we just come into the world with. So, you know, there have been a lot of studies on why, um, on people's just even their neurochemistry, almost just like the, the, the shape of their brain, how it relates to usually the, the, um, the, the defining, in, in psychology there's a term, I think it's pronounced schema, this sort of like, what is like a, a framework for reality that, that you sort of move through the world with. And, and if your framework is about you or the individual against the world, that's gonna predict that you're on one side of what is we look at as the America's political divide, and if the, the schema or the framework is more like everybody in the same pot together or everybody in it together, then that that uh, predicts a different politics. Um, so, you know, I think there are just like myriad forces outside of our families that um, actually I have read that our our social group or our peer group has a bigger impact on our po uh, political alignment than does our family origins. Um, but uh, 
I'm afraid that I ultimately can't answer the, your, 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 your question, and it's, it's quite a mystery. For the record, um, my family all kind of like, you know, bobbled around politically in various ways, and somehow, and I don't know if it's improbably, but everybody in my close family is now all kind of on, in the same uh, political camp for what it's worth, so. So a big thank you to Sarah. She'll be staying to sign books in the lobby. This was great. Thank you. If Thanks you have so not purchased a book, there will be books available for purchase in the lobby. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for coming to Thanks, Columbus. Michael. Also, a big thank you to Linda Cass and Gramercy Thanks, Books Linda. and Drexel Theater. Thank you to Michael and Sarah. Thank you very much. And to Drexel and United Way. Thank you for being here. Have a good night.